Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. This is part four on my five-part series on Graham Holdings. Today, we look at the company's dividends. Um, I should start by letting you know that if I was a dividend investor, Graham Holdings would not be a company that I would looking at to include in my portfolio. The simplest reason for that is the dividend is low um, relative to other options, that you, in fact, relative to the S&P 500 in total. In addition to that, however, there are some weaknesses based on the current market uh, as a result of COVID to make this a less safe option for dividend investors than most stocks. Um, so I'm gonna go through all of those points today and let you know why that is. The first thing that I look at when looking at dividends is simply uh, the amount of dividends that have been paid and that's the total amount of dollars that have been paid as well as the dividends per share. Oftentimes those two numbers are not the same thing. Uh, what I mean by that, when you look at this stock, for example, you can see that for the last three years, dividends have been basically flat. Uh, in terms of the total dollars paid to shareholders. However, the dividends paid per share have increased gradually over the last three years. They've increased at about 4.5%, 4.7% a year. And the reason for that is the company's been buying back stock. When a company buys back stock, the same amount of dividend dollars paid to investors are paid out to fewer uh, shareholders and there are fewer shares, and therefore the, the amount per share increases gradually. So one of the benefits that a company has of uh, buying back shares is that it allows a company to increase uh, the amount of dividends that the, that the investor is receiving without reducing the company's cash flow. And that's what's happening with this stock. Um, you can see that the, another thing about this company is that the dividends for this company have been gyrating dramatically. And so I want to explain what's going on here. This company paid a small dividend and it increased over time um, until about 2012. In 2013, as we've talked about, this company sold the Washington Post, which was a major asset for $250 million. When they sold that, it looks like they decided to give some of those profits to the shareholders in the form of a dividend. Uh, and then because they gave that giant dividend, the next year they didn't pay a dividend in 2014. Then in 2015, they reinstituted the dividend and that went down for a couple of years. And now it is sort of stabilized in 2017 the amount that's being paid out is stabilized and the company's buy, bought back some shares, which has allowed the amount of dividends per share to increase over time. I don't ever look at this company as being one that's going to pay a lot of dividends. That's because the model for this company is to take that money and reinvest it. They believe they're going to do a better job of reinvesting the money than you will, especially recognizing that when they pay you, they have to, you have to pay taxes on it. And their attitude is they'd rather save that tax revenue and use that as a investment vehicle for themselves to create a larger value for the shareholders. We'll see over time if they do that. I happen to think they're more likely to do that than not. Um, I'm happy to give them an opportunity to see how that works. But that's really what's happening with, with the actual dividends for this company and why there's been sort of this gyration. While I don't uh, think that we should be looking at Graham Holdings as a dividend investment stock, and in fact, as a dividend investor, I would simply pass on this and move on to the next one. And as someone who doesn't care very much about the dividends because I'm more worried about wealth creation through all the mechanisms available to ownership, um, I would almost just glance over this. However, uh, it is one of the researchers that I do for a company. It does give me a certain amount of enlightenment as to what's going on with the company to study this. So I just thought I would go over it again as more of an exercise than as a motivator to buy or not buy this company. Um, so when I'm looking at dividends, uh, I look at four factors. I look at what is the yield and growth and what's that, how's that changed over time and why. I look at the dividend safety in the context of earnings, which means basically what percentage of this company's earnings are going to pay dividends. The higher that number is, the less attractive the company is because there's more risk associated with the dividend remaining the same. I look for dividend safety in the context of cash flow, again, the same reason. And finally, I look at dividend safety in the context of the current debt load, and we'll go over that when we get to that slide. So first yield and growth. So the yield for this stock is 0.92%, so less than 1%. Um, the S&P 500 average yield is 1.57%, so this company is paying about two thirds of the dividend of the S&P 500. That's one of the reasons why, as an investor who is interested in dividends, I would not buy this stock because I could just go buy the S&P 500 and get a 50% higher dividend yield. This company is not growing its yield uh, fast enough to justify um, to tr justify overlooking that. In fact, over the last five years, the dividend uh, yield has decreased by 8.7%. But again, you can see all of that happened in 2014 and 15 
when the company was sort of readjusting how much they were going to pay in dividends as a result of the sale of the Washington Post. Uh, if you look at it more closely in the last three years, the dividend increase has been 4.7%. So the dividend that we've been getting has been growing faster than inflation. So that's good. We like that. So, uh, but, but again, we're just not buying the stock for the dividends. And so again, I would almost say, just forget this. You're going to get a little tiny check every quarter out of this company, you know, go reinvest it, but don't invest in, in, you could even make an argument just to reinvest dividends in this company because they're not significant enough to really move the needle. Dividend safety in the context of earnings. So this company last year paid out 9% of its earnings to shareholders. That's a very, very low number. Um, generally speaking, that number would be a turnoff to me because I would be saying that's not enough. They should be returning money to the shareholders, not hoarding that much cash. Uh, but I know that this company has bought several companies in the process of buying another company right now. And so my presumption is that they're going to take that money that they're retaining and they're going to they're going to reinvest it hopefully intelligently and hopefully at a rate that's higher than you know most people would earn on the money where they're given the money. So we'll see about that. Um, the average payout for the pay ratio for the last five years is 11.3%. Actually, I, I fudged that number. That's the average payout ratio for the last four years. Again, um, the company had no earnings in 2014. We can get into why that was, but it's really not important. It's far enough in the past. That I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, just to give you a sense, the average payout ratio for the S&P 500 is about 40%. So this company's paying about 25% of what a typical S&P 500 company would pay in dividends, which again is one of the reasons why a dividend investor should overlook this company. And we're looking at it again because of the company's ability to hopefully to al allocate to allocate capital. If the company's ability to allocate capital is better than the average investor, then you should allow them to do it because they're doing it with pre-tax dollars. In other words, they'd pay me a dividend and I'd have to pay taxes on that dividend and then have what's left to reinvest. Dividend safety in the context of cash flow. This is just a different prism that we use to look at uh, how safe the dividend is over time. Um, this simply takes into account not only the company's cash flow, which is the total amount of money that came in, but also the company's capital expenditures to figure out the free cash flow. And then we went in what percentage of that free cash flow is used to pay dividends. Um, so you can see that the dividend payout from cash flow is about 41%. Uh, that is uh, rough, generally it's about 50 to 60% for the S&P 500, again, depending on the company's industry. Uh, the average payout ratio over the last five years was 21%. Um, I'm happier with 21% than I am with 40%, but again, you need to remember that COVID has kind of thrown a monkey wrench into a lot of these analysis, and I'm having to sort of overlook some things in 2020 that I would not normally overlook because I really do believe some things that happened in COVID are very, very kind of one-time items and companies will recover. And I think this is one of those companies. Um, but just to give you a sense, ca uh, cash flow from operating activities in 2000, uh, that should say 2020, um, were $165 million. They spent $93 million, which is pretty typical on capital expenditures, gave them free cash flow of $71 million. They paid $29 million in dividends. So cash flow to pay dividends was about 41, 42%. Um, again, if you look at the earnings for the last four years, 16, 17, 18, and 19, the company earned about $260 million versus $160 million they earned last year. I think that $260 or $270 million is probably closer to the, the typical non-COVID number and when you see that happens, you see the cash flow to pay dividends is 15%. And at 15%, it's a non-issue, right? The company shouldn't have any capital expenditure requirements. They're going to make it difficult to pay cash flow, which is, which is what this analysis is really looking at. This last slide looks at dividend safety in the context of debt. So this is a little bit convoluted. Um, the company's debt's about $907 million. The company's interest obligation net after interest income is about $29 million. So their, their actual amount of interest that they pay on their debt is about 3.28%. So what this slide looks at is how would that payment change as interest rates were to rise? I think interest rates are historically low. I think most people do. If they're historically low, that means they're more likely to go up than to go down. And so at what level of new interest rate would the uh, obligation to pay the bank be large enough that they would no longer have the money to pay the dividends to the shareholders? That's really what we're looking at here. So let's just work across the board here. So at an interest rate of 4%, the, 
that would mean that the company has to spend another six million dollars on interest relative to 3.8 or 3.28 percent they're currently paying so that works out to uh, a new adjusted cash flow of 65 million dollars so they pay dividends of 29 million dollars their free cash flow becomes 35 million dollars which is 65 million dollars minus 29 million dollars it works out to a dividend payout of cash flow of 45 percent right so that's no problem we can do that without a problem and then as you look as interest rates climb you start to see it gets into trouble at eight percent the company's paying another 42 million dollars in interest that's uh, uh the cash flow becomes 28.83 percent but they're currently paying 29 million dollars in dividends which means they now no longer have the money to pay the dividend and they're uh they're, they have a shortfall which means the interest is now gobbled up all the ability to pay the, the dividend um and that becomes a payout ratio of 102 percent which is extraordinarily unsustainable i would argue anything over you know 70 percent is probably unsustainable so anything over interest rate over seven percent becomes a problem uh, and then obviously the problem gets bigger and bigger as interest rates go up. What this tells you is that as a dividend investor, you should not be comfortable with this level of debt. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is that the uh, cash flows for this company are uh, reduced dramatically as a result of COVID, and this is not a normal year. So if you run it through the filter of that, you see it's safer than it looks. Again, there's enough reasons why a dividend investor should not be buying this stock that this almost doesn't matter. The dividend is not very high in terms of yield. The increases are not very significant. It is not a goal of this company to be a big dividend paying stock, in my opinion. I think they have other things they'd prefer to do with the money, including invest it and buy back shares. And then when you look at the fact that the debt load for this company is large enough and the current cash flows are small enough that any significant increase in interest rates would be a big problem for this company. And I think you see that as a dividend investor, you should probably pass on Graham Holdings Company. I'm not a dividend investor. For me, dividends are a happy accident. I'm happy to get them, but they don't make a big part of my decision. And so I will continue to buy this company or to own this company, uh, potentially for the very, very long term. Uh, but as a dividend investor, you probably shouldn't. So that's it for dividends for, um, for Graham Holdings Company. Thank you.